all our services are on live stream, and our website is believersfellowship.lk, and you can watch them on YouTube, Instagram, and if this ministry has been a real blessing to you, I think it's good that you share with others, and uh, let them also be blessed, because what you have been blessed, you need to share with others, and they also can be blessed, and that can be like a seed that you sow, whereby you can also increase in knowledge and wisdom. So share what you have been, been blessed with. Talk to others about all what the Lord has done in your life through his word. Because in this place we magnify his word, we glorify his name, we, uh, we lead people to walk in the spirit, and uh, we also believe in the God our Father who blesses us. We talk a lot about our Father who, who is our Heavenly Father. He, he's so fond of his children. We make the message so easy for people to grasp and uh, put into their lives so that they would uh, be able to know that God is not a tyrant but God is their Father who loves them, who cares for them, who's interested in bring, bringing the blessing into the lives of individuals. So uh, be a blessing. God has called us to be a blessing. You shall be a blessing. He said, he said you are the seed of Abraham. And when God called Abraham, he said, Abraham, I'm blessing you that you might be a blessing to many others. You shall be a blessing to many others. So every one of us in... Uh, whatever stage we are. And we need to be a blessing to other people's lives. And don't say what you don't have. Say what you have. Give what you have. And be a blessing to people. Because God brings increase. He will never tell you to give anything that you don't have. He doesn't want you to loan. He doesn't want you to pledge. He doesn't want you to get involved with anything. He says... I mean, even the little boy who had the little, I was sharing in the morning also, even the boy who had that little, just two fish and five loaves of bread, maybe those, that was incomparable to what was the real need there. The need was to feed the 15,000 people there, 5,000 men plus women plus children. But that boy became a blessing with the little that he had. And what did Jesus do? Jesus didn't turn around and say, this is too little. How can, how can we feed fire? Don't make, make a fool of yourself. And you make me a fool. No, he didn't. The first thing he did was he, he gave thanks unto the Lord. Thank you, Father, for the five loaves and the two fish. This boy was sensitive, more sensitive than the 12 disciples. This boy was more sensitive than those who were around Jesus. And I believe this boy was, was somebody who was seated right in front of Jesus, who was able to overhear when the disciples came and said, send the people away. Send the people away because we have nothing to give them to eat. And Jesus said, you feed them. He said, how can we feed? And then the boy appeared and said, I have three lo- five loaves and two fish. And, and they, the disciples would have made fun of it. But when Jesus, I mean, I suppose Jesus was there watching all what was happening there. And they brought it to Jesus. They probably would have made a fun, they tried to would have, you know, make, make, make fun of Jesus too, probably. I mean, this is all what we have. You mean to say you want us to feed with this? He said, bring it here. And he thanked the Father. I see in many instances where Jesus thanked And in this particular instance, he said, thank you, Father. And he gave them to the disciples and said, go serve. And people were blessed. And the other time that I see is Jesus took the cup and the the bread and he, he thanked the Father. He said, thank you, Father, for blessing the people with this covenant that I'm about to cut with the in the New Testament. 
And uh, he thanked the father. Be thankful always. Have a heart of gratitude to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. When he went to the tomb of um, um, Lazarus, he thanked the father. So you receive everything by thanking the Lord, not by grumbling and complaining. Get used to thanking the Lord. Always have a habit of thanking the Father. That's the, that's the strongest confession that we have in the scriptures where we thank the Lord. Oh Lord, I thank you for all what you've done for me. I thank you. I'm so thankful to you, Lord. You know, in the book of Nehemiah, when they dedicated the temple, uh, Nehemiah, let's go to the book of Nehemiah chapter Two, I believe. Chapter 8, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, let's see. They had two groups of people, we find, where they, they went before the Lord and thanked the Lord. They started thanking the Lord for what they, what they were, they did, while they were dedicating, I'm sorry, it's in the book of Nehemiah chapter 12. In Nehemiah chapter 12, and we know that Nehemiah went through a lot of things to build the temple or, or to build a wall that was broken down, which was, uh, which was to protect the Jews. And when he saw the broken wall, he went before the king and he, he got his permission and took leave. And he came, he was a cupbearer of the king. And he, he found favor, although he had many uh, people who opposed him. We find that Sanballat uh, and Tobiah and also we find the other Arabian who was against him. Maybe I should read that scripture too. Let me show you from the book of Nehemiah chapter 2 chapter 2 so you will always have oppositions to what you believe in don't you ever think that you won't have an opposition in thoughts in words that people would speak even some of the circumstances that you really thought should change but it didn't change but you, you, you feel that you're mocked and you're laughed at but don't you give up don't you give up your confession ought to be firm. So we find in uh, Nehemiah chapter 2, when he took over this project to build the wall for the children of Israel, he has one man, he went before and shared his vision with the elders and they agreed and they said, we are going to work together. And in chapter 19, with all this he went Maybe we should read from verse number 18. Then I told them of the hand of my God which was good upon me. Do you know something? Everything that you do, it's only because of the Lord. Then I told the people that the hand of my God which was good on me. So you got to know who your God is. You got to say, that's my God. He's just not God. He's my God. He's my God. As also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. We are, in, we are all in the ministry of building. When you give the gospel to somebody, you're building his ruined life. And you're bringing him into Christ, into knowing that there is no other way there is no other name that is given under heaven whereby men can be saved. The only name that is given is the name of Jesus. You build their ruined life. That's what God has called us for. To be a mediator to the world. Jesus Christ is the mediator who lives inside of us and we are a mediator between man and God and we, we, we bring the good news, the heavens good news through Jesus Christ you can be saved and we build that ruined life and make him a new creation in Christ. There's an ability of procreation through your life by the words that you speak, 
the seed words that you have in your mouth and in your heart that you speak to them and you're able to draw them to Christ because you are not just simply a representative of heaven, you are an ambassador, you are more than an ambassador, you are one who is a co-laborer with God, working together with God in this project of building lives. And that's the reason God says he, he, we are co-laborers together and he, he, he gives us rewards according to our works. That's why he, he's looking for faithful people. When we, when we walk in faithfulness, people are mean to us sometimes. They say, you don't have to be too faithful. Well, that's the qualification. That's at the end of the day, when, when Christ meets you, he says, good and faithful servant. You are good and you're a faithful servant. Remain faithful to the Lord. It's in your conscience. It's in your, it's in your life. However people treat you, it shouldn't be the ultimate. That's not the bottom line. The bottom line is you're going to be faithful to the Lord who called you. It's not how people treat you. It has nothing to do at all with your new life. It's not how people treat you and how people have misled you and how people have, have looked down upon you and how that has nothing to do with your faithfulness that you are you are a faithful person. You're a person of integrity. You believe in God. You are, he says, you are upright before the Lord. And the scripture says he would not withhold anything good from those who are upright. In the book of uh, Psalm uh, 81 and verse 11, he says, I will not withhold anything good. When he says good, anything good, everything, which means everything good that comes from the Lord, which is always perfect and they're always good. Every good and every perfect gift. You can't even try to earn it. You simply get it by doing his will, by being upright before him. He said, I'll not withhold anything good from those who walk upright before the Lord. So, this is where we are committed to the Lord. We are whole heart, we are sold out to God. Not to be slaves of God, but to be sons of God who is serving the Father. A true son has always a serving attitude towards the Father. I'm there to serve the Father. That's a person that, that you can never change. That's a person who says, I'm only in the will of God, I will never ever do what I feel. Whether people like me or not, it doesn't matter to me. That's not the bottom line. The bottom line, I'm serving my father who is good to me. He, he, it's not because he is just good to me. It's because he's, he's a soul. He, he deserves the glory. He deserves the glory and the honor due to his name. In some, I'm holding on to one or two scriptures I'd like to show you this scripture from the book of Psalm 29. The book of Psalm 29 and verse number 2. It says, in Psalm 29 and verse number 2, Give unto the Lord glory due unto his name. Give unto the Lord glory, honor, Due to his nature, his character, his name. A name has to always do with somebody's character and his nature. Give unto the Lord glory. That's praise and honor. Due unto his name. People in the world don't care about it. It means nothing to them. When you, when you make up your mind and say, I worship God, I praise God, I honor him wherever I go. It's not only in your, in your thanksgiving adoration, but even in your works, your life, you're honoring God. The people would look at you and say, you are a follower of Jesus. You, I mean, they might look at you in a, in a, in a way, in a different way, but still for all, you say, they, they look at you differently. And worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. 
Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. It's a beautiful thing to be walking in holiness. Worship the Lord with the life, with the life that you live. That's the beauty. Worship the Lord. I mean, you don't, you don't have a time of worship. You are a worshiper. That's what Jesus said to the woman of Samaria and said, the father is looking for worshippers and the father is looking for true worshippers. There are false worshippers. Oh, they would just raise hands just because, oh yeah, we come to church, let everybody see that I'm a true worshipper. No, he's looking for true worshippers who would worship the father in spirit and in truth according to the scriptures. That's the true worshiper. And the father is looking for true worshipers. And she was struggling with this worship. And we know the Messiah will come and teach us, you Jews, you come and you tell us that Jerusalem is a place of worship and we know that our our father Jacob, he, he brought us to this mountain. But Jesus said, the hour cometh and now is. The hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. So worship is not just only an action. I mean, I know, I lift up my hands, I worship him. I'm not a robot, I'm not a statue. I have emotions, I have Im- even, even spiritual emotions. I'm, I'm somebody who, is, who loves to worship in action. But at the same time, I'm a worshiper even in my workplace. I'm a worshiper wherever I go. I'm a worshiper in whatever I do amongst people. I'm still a worshiper. That people see me as a worshiper. I'm not trying to brag about in front of them to say, oh, I'm just a holy person. No, I'm a worshiper. I'm set apart to worship him. I'm set apart. I'm somebody who is who is a worshiper. You, you, cannot, you cannot separate my worship and my personality. My personality is I'm a worshiper. That ought to be the personality of yours. They are a worshiper. You worship God in spirit and truth. You say, Lord, I'm not worshiping somebody. I'm not worshiping a thing. I'm not worshiping anything that is around me. I'm worshiping God, worshiping God in spirit. He, God is a spirit. He's not, he's not somebody who is, whom we can try to make him an idol and try to say, okay, God, maybe I'll put you in a box, Lord, and say, that's who you are, Lord. You can't put God in a box. He's a spirit. He can be in million places at one time. Or he just fills the whole entire earth. The Bible says his glory fills the entire universe. His presence is so strong all over. You cannot try to say, okay now, well God, maybe he's in a certain place. No, he's not in a certain place. He's all over. Wherever you are, that's where he is. Because he has a covenant with you where he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Which means I'm always with you. We always think, oh, we've got to worship him. While, well, why don't you look down sometimes and see, oh my God, he lives inside of me. And this body is a temple of God. That's the reason I keep my body clean because that's his temple. It's not my temple, it's his temple. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible says. So if my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to glorify him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19, where it says, I am purchased property. I don't belong to myself, I belong to him. What? Knowing not that your, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? God himself which is in you or who is in you. That word which is in the old uh, old English, but it simply means who is in you. Who you have of God. You are not your own. That's the reason we need to 
Every decision we make in life, we got to know, God, are you pleased with what I'm doing? Is it okay, Lord? If you're, if you're displeased, I don't want to do it just for the sake of doing it, just to please my flesh or just to please people. I'm, my life is not to please people. I'm not living to please people today. I'm living to do the will of God. I think we should do another scripture. Okay, we'll go to that also, but the next verse, verse 20. For you are bought with a price. What was the price? The blood of Jesus Christ. You are purchased by the blood of Jesus. Therefore glorify God or honor God in your body. Your body is important. It's all right, I worship God in the spirit. I mean, I have my worship times, but after all, I have my own freedom, my body. Well, your body, he wants you to glorify him in your body. And in your spirit, which are God's, your body belongs to God. Oh, I didn't know that I was getting involved with this. That's too, that's, that's too intimate. That's too interfering. Although God interferes, he's a gentleman. He would never go against your will. Although he has a will for your life, he will never go against your will. He's a gentleman. He will never get, get crashes into your decisions. But because of your love for him and because of all what he has done, I mean, because he's worthy of all honor and glory. That's the reason we, give, we, we, we glorify him. He's, wor- he's worthy. He's worthy to receive glory and honor. Give, give unto the Lord glory due. He, it's due unto his name. People despise and they say, who is God? We don't know that they're God. But you are God's people. You and I are different. We live so differently. And uh, First Peter chapter, First Peter chapter 4, First Peter chapter 4 and verse number 1 onwards. First Peter chapter 4 and verse number 1 onwards. For as much as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind, understanding that what he has suffered for you needs to be understood time to time and time again. We've got to remind ourselves. Christ suffered for us in the flesh. He suffered for us. Arm yourself or consider yourself likewise with the same mind. There was somebody who paid a price for my salvation. I'm so valuable. I'm so valuable because he paid the price for me. For he that has suffered in the flesh sees from sin. It simply means, it simply, you suffer some of the things that you don't want to. I mean, I don't want to get involved with some of these things. That's where the suffering comes. It's not that I, it's not that I want, to, I want to be a good person in the presence of people. I just don't like it now because my father doesn't like it. He lives inside of me. He's inside of me. So he that has suffered in the flesh, you cease from sin. Why don't people cease from sin? Because they don't suffer their flesh. How do I suffer my flesh? Is it, does it mean that I got to pin myself up or do something? No, it simply means, no, I don't partake of that. No, I don't do this. No, it's no. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't lie, I don't cheat, I don't want to live a hypocrite. No, I'm sorry. You would know where you got to draw the line and say, I belong to God. I know I can associate with you to the extent where I draw my line and say, no, whoever it could be, I got my, I got my uh, parameters, I got things drawn out and I say, no, that's it. I cannot, I, I, ha- I need to be sure that I cease from sin. And the next verse, let's go, it tells us that you no longer sh- live the rest of your time in the flesh for the lusts of men. The last the word lust simply means strong desires of men. You don't live for the strong desires of men, but to do the will of God. I know it, 
This is, this is something that is very important. Are we living for the desires, of strong desires of men, or are we living the will of God? And it's always possible to live according to the will of God if you choose to live. If you say, I choose to live, that's, that's what I choose. That I no longer live the rest of my time to please people. I'm not a man pleaser. I'm not a people pleaser. If they don't like me, I can't help it. I'm not being mean to them. I'm not, I'm not opposing them. I'm not trying to change their conscience. Each person lives by their own conscience. They have, they have hardened their conscience to the extent that they refuse to, to listen to some of your some of what you say or probably to be around you and some of them even find it difficult to be around you because you are so warm and you're so lit up and you're so full of life, darkness, death. They don't want to come close to you. They feel, oh, this guy is, there's something in you that, I, that is really bothering me. And they get agitated and they might even try to oppose you because you are, you are the light of God's, you, you are the light of God. You have so much of peace in the midst of confusion around because you're, you're the house of God. You, you house God inside of you. I mean, it, it, it is a mystery. It cannot be understood in the natural. God lives inside you. It's a mystery. That's what Paul says it. In uh, Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians, I'd like to read the, the, other, the other scripture. Okay, we'll just leave for Peter. Let's go to the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians chapter number 1. We'll read a couple of scriptures there. And in verse number 25 onwards, Paul says, Therefore, I'm, a min, I'm made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to f- fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages, from generations, but, hath not, but now it hath, now is made manifest. Now it's revealed. Now it's been, it has been hid for ages from generations. And now is made manifest to, to his saints. How? In verse number 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of his hidden secret or mystery among the Gentiles. We were Gentiles. Which is Christ in you, Christ in you. This is the mystery that was hidden for ages and generations. Christ in you, the hope of glory. God in you. It's it's mind-boggling. Everybody would say, we want to go to worship God. But God says, I'm inside of you. I'm not outside of you, I'm in you. People run to go somewhere. I got to go worship there. I got to go, go worship this mountain. I got to go. But God says, I'm in you. Your body is my temple. I'm a house of God. Can you imagine that you are a house of God? But when we come collectively together, we also call ourselves, this is the house of God. But individually, we are also houses of God. That's the mystery that was amongst the Gentile that was hid for ages and it has been revealed. That's why when one receives, it's a very important thing to receive Christ. When one sinner gets saved, all heaven rejoices, the Bible says. When one comes to Christ, imagine the millions and the trillions of angels, they all get together and Praise the Lord, another soul got saved through the Lamb of God. And there's a lot of noise up there. I'm, I'm told by the statistics that people have, that, that they have they found, they said 
Every two minutes people are getting born again in this world. How can heaven be a silent place? Every two minutes people are coming to know Jesus and all heavens. They start rejoicing for one and the next is born. The next is born. The next. Heaven is not a silent place. It's a very noisy place. If you ever thought that this is too noisy here, when you go to heaven you will find my. This is really noisy because all the angels and the saints together they are all rejoicing. For the victory of Christ. The victory of Christ on the cross is always celebrated in, in the years to come. They celebrated all, even before they were all looking forward for the crucifixion. But thereafter, we find that all heaven is rejoicing for what Christ has done. That's the reason you could see in the, even in the, in, the, in the book of Revelation, it's talking about the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation. They're rejoicing. And who is seated on the throne? The Lamb of God. He's the same. He's God himself. Became man and came for man for the victory of man and died as a man and has brought us into this revelation where Christ knew the hope of glory. You're not an ordinary person. You're somebody who has been set apart to live for him. Praise the Lord God Almighty. We need to rejoice. He reveals things to us. And we need, just need to say, God, I'm so blessed that I'm saved today. I'm saved today. I mean, that ought to be, if all heaven rejoices, the Bible says, Jesus said, he said, all heaven rejoices. I think we have read that scripture. Maybe we should read that scripture. I like, I write scripture reading. I just enjoy. Because the more I read, the more I get. Luke, let's go to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. And verse number 10. Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. Every time a person comes to know Christ, there's so much of joy in the presence of God. There's joy in the presence of the angels of God over all, I mean all heaven rejoices. There are trillions of angels up there. And, and angels were made not for us to bow down and worship to. Angels are never called sons of God. But you are called a son of God. Angels are only called ministering spirits, servants. They're only ministering spirits. They're not some, some to whom. He can be, an angel can come before you, can be tall as this building is. But you're not supposed to bow down and worship the angel. They're only there at the commands of the saints who are born. They're at the command. They're always waiting. So that's the reason when you, when you confess what the devil says, the angels say, I'm sorry, I can't help you. I can only help you if you speak the word. In uh, Hebrews, let's read that. Angels are very strong, very powerful in the spirit. They're very strong. People who see angels, my days, the angel, the first thing the angel has to say, fear not. Because they don't belong to the class of man. They're very fierce. They're strong. Mighty are they. But they don't belong to the class of men. We cannot associate with them. They're ministering spirits. Let me show you that. Oh, some people say, oh, I wish I was an angel. I'm looking at a little child. Oh, she looks like an angel. No, don't ever call a human an angel because humans are made in the likeness and in the image of God. Especially when one is born again, you would really see the light of God in that person. Don't ever try to think that you can transform yourself to be an angel. Oh, I wish I would see an angel. You don't have to. You don't have to. Okay. Verse num chapter number 1 and verse 13. Okay, we'll read verse number 6 first. 
Read verse number three onwards, three. For unto which of the angels he at any time said, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be unto him a father, and he shall be unto me a son. So angels are never called sons of God. Angels are never called sons of God. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he said, let all the angels of God worship him. It's talking about Jesus, the firstborn. The angels need to worship the firstborn or the first begotten, I would say. That's, that's the correct word there. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels uh, spirits, his ministers of flame. They are only ministering spirits like flame there. Right? Verse, let me go down to verse number 13. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make my, uh, make thine angels any means thy footstool. He didn't say, none of the angels to come and sit by my side. But you and I, as children of God, saved, born again, blood washed, spirit filled, we are seated together with him in heavenly places. Ephesians chapter two and verse six. But none of the angels had that position. None of the angels have that position, but you and I have. Verse number 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister or to serve for them who shall be heirs of salvation? We are the heirs of salvation. They've been sent for, for us to be ministered to. Angels, remember wherever you go, you have angels who are around you, not to be worshipping them, but to know they are there to minister unto you, to serve you, to protect you, to guard you. They're not there to worship, to be worshipped. They're always there, and they only hearken to the voice of God. In Psalm 103, and verse number 20, I believe, Psalm 103 and verse number 20 says, they only hearken, Psalm 103 and verse 20. Is that right? Okay. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, excel in strength. They excel in strength that do his commandments, hearkening to the voice of his word. So what's, What's this scripture telling us? They excel in strength, they are strong and mighty in power that do the commandments. They only do com the commandments of God. And they hearken to the voice of his word. So when you speak the voice of God's word, you're a voice that speak God's word being an heir of God and they hearken unto you. When you say, oh God, Nobody loves me, nobody cares for me. Oh, I, I, I'm fed up of life. The angels, they bind their, you, you only bind the hands of the angels. But when you start speaking the word of God, the angels are at work for you. They are ministering spirits to those who are, who are heirs of salvation. So you are the saved ones that the ministering angels are there to minister to. They are for you. They are not against you. They are for us. When the angels stood before Joshua, Joshua said, are you for us or for them? He said, for none. I am for the Lord. And if you are for the Lord, then I am going to work for you. And if you are not, again, not for the Lord, then he immediately said, my, I thank you. I mean, the Lord God Almighty is always for us and he is not against us. Thank God for his grace. I'm going to close quickly with the book of uh, Nehemiah. So Nehemiah was called to build. You're always in the business of building people. You're always, you've been called, you're the temple of God. 
You are the temple of God. You are the house of God. What needs to proceed out of God proceeds out of you. When you go, you're, you're a living temple actually. You're a living temple. You're a stone of the temple. Right? So wherever you go, that's where God goes with you. That's the reason he wants you to be a witness to people. He wants you to be somebody who is different. Just because the world doesn't line up with you, it does not mean that you've got to line up with the world. you just got to stay strong in what you believe in. Right? They would, they would say things against you. They would just mock and laugh at you and they would show the... I mean, they would even try to tell you, my, look at this world. Your, your, your mind is so small. You, you think of so... The world is so big and huge. He said, yeah, that's, that's right. You don't see it the way I see it. And who owns this world? My father owns it. And whom has he given this world to? To you. To you. It was given to Adam. Adam handed it over to the devil. And the devil is running and doing things. And when people... People try to accuse me, oh, if there is a God, why do we have all this stuff happening? None of this stuff is happening because God is handling this world. God is not the one who is handling this world. The God of this world, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse number 4, it says, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the people in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them who believe not. They're not believers. Non-believers have been blinded in their minds. They can't see like the way you see. Let the gospel, let the light of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in them. So what is, what is in your life? The gospel has been received and the gospel has been shining through your life now. The gospel has been shining through your life. Their minds are blinded. When they act differently to you, you don't have to be bothered because I know, oh God, I feel sorry for this man because he's blinded. Lord, open the eyes of this man so that he would receive the gospel that he would also shine as much as I would shine. He's blinded, he's blocked up. He says that we live in a small world, but to see, they are blinded to believe everything that they see and feel and and, and they are moved by their emotions. They are blind. They are blind. But you, through the eye of faith, you can see everything around you. In fact, the Bible says, if you're, if you're in Christ and if you have, I mean, uh, and if you despise his goodness, you also become like a blind person. Not knowing that you have been forgiven of all your sins. In 1st, 2nd Peter chapter 1 and verse 8, I believe. 2nd Peter chapter 1 and verse 8. For if these things be not in you, if you don't have this characteristic of the new nature and are bound in you, they make you that you shall, that you shall never be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The next verse. But he that lacketh these things or the characteristic or the nature or you have despised your, your new life, he cannot see afar off and has forgotten and has forgotten the, the, um, the person who lacks these things, he is blinded. He cannot see afar off and he has forgotten that he has been purged from his old sins. Don't live like the world, the blinded person. You're not supposed to be blind. You're supposed to be so awakened to open to wisdom of the wisdom of God. Things that others don't see, you will see through dreams, through visions, by reading the word, by impressions that you get. You'll be amazed that certain things you would know. I knew this was about to happen. I saw this in my dream. You say, I know it. Not because you're a fortune teller, because the Holy Spirit knows everything. Good that I did not commit myself to this thing because this is going down the tubes. God has already spoken to me. There are several things that I have 
in my life, I'm how the Lord has revealed to me through dreams and visions and through people, while even in conversation with saints, I've got, I got a word. I said, yeah, Lord, I thank you. I was about to make this decision, but I'm not going to make this decision. And I found that if I had ever made that decision, it would have been a flop. You're open. When people call you, you're so narrow-minded, you say, you are the one who is so narrow-minded. In fact, the people in the world are so narrow-minded that they only can, they only can make their decision based on what they see, hear, and feel. But you make your decision based on what the Word says and what the Holy Ghost says. Because the Holy Spirit knows everything that's going to happen. People talk a lot about a lot of things. Influential people, people who are, I mean, they give you a lot of promises, but they are not promise keepers. Only God is a true promise keeper. If he said something, he will do it for you. If he said something, he will do it for you. That's the reason you got to bank on his word and say, I fully trust his word. Enough of me trying to live like, uh, uh, live the, 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 the kind of life that I was leading in the past. I've come, into the, I've come into understanding that I'm a new creation now. All things have passed away. All things have become new. I'm somebody who is like so. I'm somebody like, I mean, I'm heaven sent. I'm here. I'm a co-worker with God, working in his vineyard because I'm a builder. I'm a builder. I'm, I'm building the lives of ruined people. I'm a builder. I'm a builder. We're going to close with uh, Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse number 18. For then I told them of the hand of God, hand of my God that was upon me. Also, uh, and, uh, as also the king's words, he had favor with the king that he had spoken unto me and they said, let us rise and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. See, when you are sure, when you are assured of who you are and what you are called for, you strengthen yourself with those around you. And you strengthen yourself, you get stronger and stronger. And then, verse 19, but Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the servant of the Amorite, and Gishem of the, the Arabian, these three, Gishem, Tobiah, and Sinbalat, these opposed the plan of God. Now, these, these are people who were demon-possessed, I would say. You may have people who would be demon-possessed, who can be so near to you, and they can be so demon-possessed, and when they hear the kind of strength that you're walking in, they will turn around and they, and they, they will start laugh and scorn. They laugh to scorn and despise us. Here we are strengthening, we have strengthened ourselves, we have got the approval of the king, and moreover we have a word from the Lord that God has strengthened us. It's God is working through us. Now here these three people come with their two cents worth and they laughed at the strength of God. God can take you to people, God can take you to influential people and, and draw favor just for you. But these people, they laughed to scorn and despised us. Have you been despised? Have you been laughed that they would scorn you to the extent where you feel so insulted? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing good work. I started to do a good work and I, I'm enjoying my good walk with the Lord. Here somebody laughs and sits around who is so close to me, who should be encouraging me. I thought he should be an encouragement or she should be an encouragement. And they laugh. And they laugh to scorn and despise. What is this thing that you do? What is it that you're doing? You rebel against the king. You rebel against the laws of the land. You're a rebel in what you're doing. So they laughed at him. They laughed at the work that they were trying to do. And they despised. And they said, you're a rebel. You turn around and say, I'm not a rebel. You need to say, I'm not, you cannot despise me. This is a good work that I have begun in my life. 
And the next, the next verse we understand is very clear. I love this word. Then answered I unto them and said unto them, the God of heaven. It's nice. You're connected with the source of all strength and power and prosperity. The God of heaven has approved it. The God, I'm in touch with the God of heaven. I'm talking about God that you don't see in the natural. And you can, you can say, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. He will advance us. He's going to do what we cannot do with our hands. When people laugh at you, you, can, you make your confessions right. I'm connected to the God of heaven. I'm connected to the one who will prosper us. And therefore we, his servants will arise and build. We are builders. But you have no portion, no right, no memorial in Jerusalem. We have nothing to do with your opinions. We never asked your opinions. This is what you, you should come up with. We never asked your opinion. Now, I understand when we are very close to somebody who is our husband or our wife or maybe our children or somebody, but still, within your heart, you've got to be so strong. I know that we, we come from different faiths and one of us gets saved, another don't, but we come from different, but to keep peace, we still must be strong within us. We can keep peace with people, but be strong within us. And we can rebel their thoughts and say, I don't receive none of those thoughts. Within me, I'm strong. And if you are true, and if you're strong and your light is shining forth and your love is so oozing out of you and the power of God is so blessing you and prospering you, they would eventually say, tell me of the God that you're serving that I would want to know too. That's the reason you got to be strong in what you're doing. Right? You got to be strong in what you believe in. I just came to this scripture, but I, uh, maybe I should close. So thanksgiving is one important factor in your life. And you should always be a person of thanksgiving. Right? I'll just close with Nehemiah 12 and verse number 31. Okay. And I brought up the princesses of Judah upon the wall and, up, and appointed two great companies of them that gave thanks, very important, giving of thanks. Even when you don't see things happening in your favor, you always thank the Lord. When things are not going right, they appointed a great company, they appointed two great companies of people just to give, thank you Jesus, thank you. Ho I mean, they, they, I mean, they didn't know the name of Jesus at that time, but, but they said, Jehovah, we thank you. Oh, God, we thank you. Oh, God, we thank you. Oh, we, they were just appointed two great companies. We don't know, thousands of people, two, two great groups of thousands of people. They were just appointed to say, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. They were just appointed to thank. So every time you need to say, thank you, Lord. I thank you, Father. When you have these ugly thoughts coming into you, you say, oh, Father, I thank you that you always prosper me. And people just laugh to scorn. You say, oh, Lord, I thank you. There was a great company in the Old Testament, but, but I'm the greatest company because I am very important. A New Testament saint is more greater than the Old Testament, even saints of God. Because you are blood washed and God lives inside of you. Right? So I'm just encouraging you to be always thankful. Always be thankful to the Lord. They appointed a great company just to be thanking the Lord. You make sure that every time you go through any kind of a, 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 an opposite force rising up against you, you always say, thank you, Lord. I know that you're with me. I need wisdom. And God will give you wisdom. Father, I pray today that the glory of the Lord God Almighty is moving in and through our lives today and touching lives, healing bodies, and setting people free and making them to understand how near their God is to them, even as much as who is inside of us. Father, we thank you for the grace of God, the love of God, the goodness of God that would follow them all the days of their lives. 
that these are changed people. These are your people, Lord. And those, even those who are viewing right now, Father, if somebody is so discouraged because of the demonized people who have surrounding them with, with bad thoughts and bad words and laughing to scorn and despising them, Lord, that they would rise up and say, our God will prosper us. Our God will prosper us. The God of heaven will prosper us. The God of heaven will help us build ruined lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the great mystery that is revealed to us. Hallelujah. Let's prepare ourselves to partake in the covenant meal. The covenant meal is so important to us. It's not just a ritual, not a religious tradition. But it's a tradition of the word of God that we partake as often as we come together that we need to partake of this covenant meal reminding us of the covenant that he cut for us on the cross. He stood between heaven and earth as one hand before God and one before people and said, I'm the mediator. I make a covenant with man. All who believe in me shall have eternal life. And the God of heaven came down into us and he agreed with the mediator, Jesus Christ, and made a covenant with us. We believe in the message of the cross, in the declaration and the power of the Holy Spirit that brought us together and made us one in Christ. And our spirits are made one with him. New creation in Christ Jesus. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. It is a mystery that will hit for ages in generations passed by. But it's revealed to us whose eyes are open now. We're no longer blinded in our minds, but God, as we honored him and we, we received him, Lord of our lives, things changed. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord.